My name is indeed Muzikininza, and I have the opportunity to just go over this. Uh, it's a big sort of in some institutions or in these very institutions, it's a it's a it's a module, so it's quite cumbersome and it's quite a big uh, topic. But then I tried to make it summarize it, so to say, in a in a, in some slides. However, you will just bear with me because we've been given this time to go over this topic of academic skills, academic writing skills. And this module is actually meant for our honors or postgraduate diploma students. Masters or PhD students are welcomed. But then in mind, when we were, or rather when I was setting up or preparing this material, I had in mind the honor students that are just starting out and uh, just getting a feel of what it is to do research, how it is to go around getting all the research problems and reading literature and putting it all together, trying to make sense of it all. Um, not to say, needed to say that our master's students don't need these skills, but then I'll, I presume they have heard or sat down to, excuse me, to, to talk about it with in times past. But then it would be def it definitely would be a benefit and a refresher to our senior postgraduate students or fellows. Otherwise, uh, our session for today will cover just about the following. I have the importance of academic writing skills, conduct and expectations of academic writing, language, tables and figures, structure sources of literature, comparing views and I, or ideas of other authors in, and conclusion and referencing. So we'll look basically how you go about, uh, or rather some of the important things that one needs to be call, uh, take cognizance of whilst you are going about doing your academic uh, pursuits. Because all in all, this material concerns academic writing what is academic writing? Academic writing uh, is a formal style of writing used in institutions and scholarly publications or in our communities. So essentially we want you to have a grasp of that when you are um, in an institution, whatever material that you write or submit, it has to meet certain levels of expectation. It has to, you have to communicate it in a way that is fitting in this institution, in the particular institution, whether it's ideas, arguments or requests, whatever the case might be. On the slide there, I had put uh, some, some of the things that are, that are used in academic writing. Um, I don't know, I wanted to put, use a pointer there. So we, in academic writing, what we do is we do, or rather in research, we do, we identify a problem. I, I put this research process just so that you can have an understanding of what happens in research. And the important or the integration of your academic skills is important as you move from one level or one step to, from step one up, to, up until step number eight when you are doing the final writing of the report. So you have to make sure that you integrate your skills properly so that you can communicate this information to, to other people. Essentially, this um, the skills for professional academics. This is rather this is a skill that professional academics have. Whilst you are a student, you have to embrace or you have to find that okay. You have to um, assume certain things when you are writing your your material. Whilst it is important for academics when you are when I'm talking about academics, I'm talking about people that are in the profession, that are writing, uh, doing research publications or research conferences, communicating to industry issues or industry problems uh, in a way that is professional and academic that brings resol uh, solutions to our economy and our, envir our environment, be it uh, the different sectors of the environment, because I understand that we are all in different sectors of our of our economy. So in our case now, we are dealing with, uh, I'm dealing with students. I, I would equate students as learner drivers 
whilst the professional uh, academics would be the, the ones that have qualified and have experience in driving. So I'm using that scenario or that's, I'm using that situation to compare it with that when, when you are driving, there are certain things that you have to be aware of, the rules of driving, the road signs, the road markings, you have to have an awareness of. So that is basically what I'm trying to teach you now, that when you are in the writing process, you have to take cognizance of the road marks or the, the, the indicators, what, how, how, what you do when you are approached by certain situations or we find yourself in certain situations, even when driving. So now when we are talking about uh, coming to academics, there are certain things that you have to possess, that you have to be aware of as you are continuing with your, your research process or your research journey in, until you become a, a master or PhD, wherever level, whatever level you're going to take it. But then even when you are leaving it at honors level in your, in your academic pursuits, you must be able to express yourself and write academic material that is having great characteristics and traits that indicates that indeed this person is has been in an institution and has um, is able to communicate with the academic community. I'll move on to the next slide. Maybe it's this pointer. All right. So skills and attributes of academic writing. These are some of the attributes that one needs to have when you are uh, pursuing your academic uh, endeavor. So I just summarize it in this form so that basically we'll all have a, a handful. You can be able to understand uh, quickly what we are talking about when we are concerned with academic writing or expressing yourself academically. Whatever academic material that you have, it must be focused, or that might be precise, it might be focused. That's why I had that icon over there that has a, a, an arrow and a, right, a, a dart. I tried to maybe illustrate what, you, what, what, uh, what all these things are about. So academic writing is structured, it is balanced, it is critical formal and evidence-based. So all these are attributes that, so whatever material that you're going to submit in future, you must check and make sure whether whatever essay, whatever, uh, be it a, a, a literature review, it, you have to ensure that it has all these characteristics such that it's, uh, it meets the standards of academic writing. All right. What do I mean when, when we say academic uh, writing must be precise and focused? the what and the why questions of your writing must be met. You need to be able to answer that question, whatever it is that you are writing, whatever writing material that you are going to do, you are going to embark on. It's important that you understand the what, what is it that you're going to do, what that you are going to uh, write and why. I wrote those uh, points, uh, cause, effects and research problems because in the back of my mind, I, I, I was thinking that all of you or all the attendees that we are having, uh, that this, of course this module is, or this session is, is meant for, is, uh, are those that are going to be embarking on, on research studies. So when you're doing research, there are causes for doing research. There are effects as well. And then what you do with all those things, you, have, you then have a research problem. When you are doing a research, again, there are causes. So some people tend to focus on the causes. What is causing a particular phenomenon in society or in an animal or whatever it is discipline that you are in. Then people tend to focus on the questions. Why? What is, um, how can these causes be manipulated so that they can give a certain result? On the other hand, some people tend to focus on the effects. If you think of cl uh, global uh, climate change, we know that we possibly, we have an understanding what causes it, but then the effects of climate change 
we are witnessing or we are seeing. So some people tend to, would like to investigate the effects of climate change and then they use particular methodologies to, to do that, to embark on that uh, pursuit or in that, uh, to study the effect, those effects. What you then tend to have is a research problem because you have the causes that, okay, this is what probably causes global effect, uh, global, uh, I'm trying to move away from saying global warming, but this is what you say when you are having climate change. This is what causes climate change, human activities, for instance, and then the effects thereof are, are unknown. So now you have a research problem that you might try to investigate and quantify using certain methodologies or procedures, depending on the particular discipline you are in. Clearly state the need for what is being investigated. You need to be able to state the need for your, uh, for writing up your research material such that it leads you to a problem statement. So if you don't have, if you don't understand exactly what the problem statement is or what the need for what you're, you tend to um, have in your mind that your academic pursuit, your right, your, your, the research that you're doing, you're only doing so that you can fulfill what the requirements of your study, because it's there, it is there that it is there, uh, it is mandatory that when you are an honor student, you write a research, uh, you write about a research topic on a research topic and present it uh, and, 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 and submit it somewhere. Or when you are doing your master's, you know that ah, it's something that you must do, one of the things that you must do to fulfill. But then I don't want you to, li to leave you misguided like that. It's important that personally you must have an understanding of what the need is for your research, for their research work. And then that will lead you to having a problem statement. You must have increased focus on, on what is seen, uh, rather, this uh, academic uh, writing, it has an increased focus on what is uh, um, what is seen uh, in the motivation and also in, in, in the aims and objectives. So basically, this sets up is the background information that you tend to have in your introduction, in, in the introduction. So the precision and the focus of the study of your research work basically needs to have um, a clear motivation and a clear aims. It must have clear aims and objectives so that you can be able to focus thereafter. Objectives in some institutions or in some colleges, they'll tell you that objectives must be measurable. So, um, those, are the ones I'm talking about are, would be the ones that are doing quantitative um, uh, studies, quantitative methodologies that are using those approaches so that they can be able to measure what they're going to look out and, and, and quantify and do that. So it must be clearly stated in the objectives there. So in the, in the introduction, maybe if I might just trace back, um, my fellow colleague mentioned that I have a background in agriculture. So my examples will most likely uh, involve, uh, if not animal production, it will involve uh, scientific or quantitative methodologies. So that would be the unfortunate thing for the folks that are doing, um, that are that, that will be utilizing uh, qualitative approaches because uh, my background is unfortunately biased on that part. Um, so we're saying that the approaches or rather academic writing must be precise and focused, that is one. Two, it must be structured. Particular structures are followed when writing academic material. This is for the benefit of readers to follow the main ideas. So when you are an academic, when you are writing and presenting your ideas and all that, it must be presented in a structured way. So ideally we have uh, all these things so that the, the reader the one that is going to be utilizing the material or reading your work, they are able to follow through. Research proposals are written in such a way. You have introduction, literature review, study area, and so forth, up until you get to the conclusion of your work. Uh, I wrote there that the end would be budget and also appendices. So you can find all that information by clicking and following all, and following that link that I inputted there. So this is with the idea that you will be also 
you will be able to get these slides so that you can be able to follow this, this link. Research articles, these are written uh, in a different way. They follow an IMRED kind of uh, presentation where you write the me introduction methods, materials and methods, results, and discussion, or even conclusion. That is a structured approach when you are writing academic work. This is in uh, dissertations. Those are written in chapters, so you can be able to follow through. In chapter one, you have introduction to two literature review, maybe, and then so forth. It differs with the different levels and institutions. Similarly, literature review, they are also having uh, approaches just as well as uh, laboratory reports. So when you're writing academically, we indicate that things your, your write-up your, your, your write indeed must have themes and paragraphs, subtitle or titles and also subtitles and so forth to indicate, to, this will indicate the different the ideas that you are having about the particular topic so that you can be able to, uh, to flow. Ideas in scientific writing are planned and organized according to themes, titles and so forth that I've just mentioned. Paragraphs contains points and supporting details. We shall look at that in a little bit, in a few few minutes. What that mean, what that entails, really. Points are statements of statements of arguments or observations that contribute a significant essential, uh, a significant and essential step in your whole structure. So, uh, I put up the slide so that you can have an understanding that the structure needs to be there from title to the paragraphs that you're going to be uh, writing. Despite the discipline that you are in, it is important that you are nicely structured in order to be able to have the readers gaining, uh, having a, a more benefit from what you have written. This is an example of a, a detailed paragraph. I got it from these, uh, sorry, I got it from, I just picked up a, 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 an interesting piece from these authors that submitted this work to, uh, to a journal. So these authors, uh, Kaya, let me just say et al, all these guys, they, submitted, they published this work in 2019. Um, the title of the, the publication of the article is Insects for Sustainable Animal Feed. Inclusive business models include uh, involving smallholder farmers and it's, part, it's published in this particular journal and all that and all that. So I put this deliberately so that uh, all of you have a better or deeper understanding of what we are talking about. So that I, I know that you, you will learn from it or you will learn from just how you write, um, how you how you write the reference. Maybe at the end of your bibliography or references, they are they are written in a particular way, and that is standard procedure. We'll also get into that. What is of interest on this slide is the structure in which, or the structure, or the way in which um, the, these authors presented these the, their ideas. I don't know which one amongst them wrote, but then maybe he's the first author, I don't know. Now, recent studies indicate, oh sorry, insect, the, the paragraph is from this article and it's uh, titled Insects as Livestock Speed. Insect studies indicate, recent studies, sorry, indicate that insect meal can be an excellent replacement of fish meal or soya, meal, or soya bean meal in animal feed. Now, thereafter, there are these numbers. These numbers indicate uh, authors that were used or other people that are cited, okay? So we have one, two, three, four, five people that have been cited saying this statement. After that, we have the following sentence that reads, insects are rich, so, uh, insects are rich sources of macronutrients and micronutrients. Again, there are two cited people there. And then black soldier fly larvae, for example, contains high levels of protein, 
37 to 63%, and fat, 20 to 40%. That have well balanced amino acids and fatty acid profiles, respectively. Again, there are citations there. Insects are good sources of, uh, of minerals such as calcium, iron, potassium, magnesium, phosphorus, and zinc, as well as vitamins, including niacin, vitamin B12, thiamine, and riboflavin. Again, there are also citations there. There are two citations there. So now I use these numbers deliberately so that to show you that there are also there are different approaches to it. You might look up an article and find numbers like this. This simply indicates that there are other authors that have been used. Uh, to support the statement. So essentially, this is the topic sentence or this is the main theme of the whole paragraph. Recent studies indicate that insect meal can be an excellent replacement of fish or soybean or fish meal or soybean meal in animal feeds. So the rest of the information is supporting this statement. Why insects are containing these nutrients? And then you have an illustration here of what black soldier fly larvae contains. Furthermore, you have another point to support just about the top sentence there, that insects are good sources of minerals just as well. So this is, to me, it seemed like a good uh, way to illustrate how a good structured or a well-structured paragraph should be. It should have a topic sentence and supporting information. Okay. Sorry, I went back to the. Now, structure, uh, right structured paragraph. So, this is the continuation of what we're talking about. You have a topic sentence, you keep to the topic. Uh, you don't avoid saying unnecessary or other things that are besides the topic sentence or bring different ideas. Paragraphs cannot simply have one sentence. If you have one sentence, that is not a paragraph. You need to have a couple of sentences in order to ensure that the reader benefits from the one sentence that you have, which is a topic sentence. And I think that is, is, is quite important um, to, to, to note. When you have a topic sentence like the one that we were talking about in the slide, that, that recent studies indicate that insects meal Insect meal can be an excellent replacement of uh, these other, other feed ingredients. Then we have supporting uh, information. We don't have just have one topic sentence and without any supporting details. I'll move on to the next one. Sorry for moving you back and forward. Now, the overall gist structure of any academically written material is commonly in the first line of his topic or, or of his sentence, which is a topic sentence. I've been mentioning this. Go and look it up. Take any uh, academic article that you find. Probably the first few sentences, let me just put it like that. The first few sentences, the first two sentences will most, most of the time, they will portray or have the main theme of the whole paragraph, such that sometimes when you read quickly, you can read the first paragraph and the last paragraph, and then you have an understanding of what is contained, because you understand that basically the rest of the following statements are just supporting what is in the topic sentence, and that gives the reader a full benefit and is able to and appreciate the credibility of your, your write-up. There has to be uh, support through evidence, explanations, or inter even interpretation. You, you must avoid, I put a tip there, you must avoid using or having long sentences because the reader tends to lose track of what you are writing. You must avoid also having long paragraphs. So to support this, I put up some, some connective words that you can use when you are when you want to connect uh, sentences so that you break your sentences, you don't, you shouldn't have long sentences like I've said. So you break up your sentences such that you can use some of these words. When you want to add, you use uh, the words additionally and also apart from this, um, as well as in addition, moreover, furthermore, 
or further or furthermore, all these are, are words that you use when you are linking two states, two sentences in a paragraph. If there are conditions, you use the word if, you use the word in that case, you use the word provided that, you use the words unless. So all those are formal words or, or words that are acceptable in scholarly publish or scholarly material. For in cases where you are comparing treatment means, for instance, you are comparing um, whatever treatment means, uh, whatever it is that you are using as your treatment. Some people have varieties, You're comparing varieties, you, 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 you use these words correspondingly, equally. Uh, one mean it might be equally, or it might be as equal as the other, or for the same reason. Or you can use in similar in a similar manner. We can use in comparison. So all these words, I just put them up so that we can be able to pick up a few and see what applies to you. For in contrast, if you are still doing comparison and you want to bring uh, differences, you use the words alternatively, although, conversely, despite. However, I highlighted the word however because. Um, recently, it came up when we were talking about the problem statement. Um, uh, I, I had the privilege of being in another workshop, and someone indicated that when you use the word however, uh, in a pro you can't just write a problem statement without having the word however, because it basically creates, it helps you set up the, the stage for what it is that you are going to be writing about. You present the problem, and then you state the word however. So that is basically creating contrasts for your readers, for the benefits of your readers. And then in some instances you want to emphasize, use the words again, in fact, interestingly, indeed, it should be noted. All those are words that you are used for emphasis or that are emphasized. So these are just a few more that I put up, but you can, I believe you can be able to read up and uh, and appreciate on that one. Uh, the cause of things, if there's something that is a result of something, or, or if something causes a phenomenon, you use as the as a consequence. You as a, con a consequence of. I'm sorry for that. Uh, a, a slash, or you use the word because of. You use due to, for the effect of something. You use since use the words the result of. So all these things are used in those uh, connective words. Remember, we, we are doing this because we want to get writers to break up their long sentences so that you can be, write, be able to write brief sentences and the readers are able to follow uh, through. The effect of, or where something is the effect of, use the words accordingly or according to or according or as a result of, or as a consequence of, or consequently, for this reason, hence, uh, so, or therefore, that. So we use these words, and I would encourage that you use them just as well. For, con for concessions or qualifications, you use admittedly, although, cal uh, clearly, though, even though, however, indeed, and obviously, now time order. If there's a time order to what you have, you're writing, you indicate first or firstly, second or third, etc., etc. Next or before, um, following, given, bef given, uh, given the above, then you continue with your statement. So now. In your write-up as well, you should be able to describe trends. You should be able to use sentences, or you should be able to use um, your vocabulary to, to to describe trends. So I have a couple of lines um, to show what it is that you could possibly say when you are seeing a, uh, when you're having a line graph like this. This is for instance is when one is having a line graph. Describing language of a graph that is uh, entitled uh, the, the title of, 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 of what we are having in the slide. 
So when you're having, for instance, the, a graph that shows a line going down, for instance, the one in A, there are words that you use. I'm sure you could be able to even type them in the chat right now that A is for a descent or decrease or decline, even the case of prices, in the case of uh, a performance or feed intake, in the case of livestock you see something declining when time goes on. In the case of B, you see a steady uh, and on and on. Let me just show you there are some words that are that one can use that are useful to extend or enhance your vocabulary when you're writing or trying to explain this graph. But the one that is of interest to me might be the one that is F. F you might have a graph that goes up and down, up and down with time, but then you should be able to describe it uh, using the right vocabulary. So you can see that it goes up and down and where you have up and down there, you see that there's words like fluctuate, there's words like uh, undulated or undulating, uh, there are dips, it goes up and down. So these are words that basically can be used in your, in your, um, right ups. Scientific writing needs to be evidence based. Details are important in academic writing. Details give a context. They help the reader to understand where you are going. They, ha they help the reader to understand. Remember earlier on we talked of a topic sentence. They help the reader to understand the topic sentence fully. If it's not credible to them, if it's not believable to them, they will question it. They'll have questions around the statement. Suppose you just say that there's hunger in sub-Saharan Africa. If you indeed leave it like that without supporting details, then someone might have questions on that. In my part of Sub-Saharan Africa, we don't experience what you are saying. What do you mean? So you need to have um, supporting details or support uh, points, supporting points or ideas in your paragraph. Like we have mentioned that you have a topic sentence, it needs to have uh, details that support that. And then the support is in the form of explanations, is in the form of illustrations. You use examples to illustrate your points. You use references, you cite what other authors have said about that particular point so that you can be able to, to, to sound more credible because people believe you, you have tend to have more credible credibility when you when you have read what other scholar uh, what other scholars have, have done. You need to have facts, you need to have arguments, you need to have statistics in some instances. You even need to have theories to back up your claims, to back up whatever statements that you that you make. Scientific writing needs to be critical, that's what we said. Now, when we say critical, everything that goes in your write-up has to be something that you have thought about. It's, it's not a mistake that you have an introduction where it is. It's not a mistake that you have a topic sentence at the end of a paragraph. Some people do that. It shouldn't, it, 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 everything, what I'm saying is, everything is well thought of and it's strategically put in the particular places where, where they are at because the writer knew exactly how or what to, to how to, 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 state, to put those statements in there in order to create so that the, the ideas flow and, the, and the, the readers are able to appreciate that information or the, the, the topic sentence um, with along with its evidence. The content of the writing, like I said, it, it's carefully done, strategically, it's properly uh, evaluated and analyzed by the writer. You don't just throw in whatever you can, is it you check is it relevant to what I want to say? You check if it's what you are writing. Is it really going to illustrate or state uh, or support my point? Now, if it's not, it's unfortunate. Some, in some instances, 
as writers or as students, we want to please our supervisors sometimes. We look up what they wrote and we throw it in the in, in our topics, even if it's not doesn't necessarily or rather it's not necessarily relevant at that point or at that time. We just throw it in there just because the supervisor was is, is in a particular was involved in a particular research. You just throw statements that is actually I think it's the name dropping. It's not uh, really acceptable. However, all we are saying is what you are writing, you must evaluate the material that you are getting as references or as supporting details. Carefully analyze it. Put it such that it supports the main idea of the topic. It should be objective and not subjective. What does that mean? You write in the third person. You don't give statements like I observed, I measured, I, I, I went out or I, I, I used questionnaires to interview participants. Whilst it's true and fine, you did those things, but when you are presenting or when you are reporting, when you are writing up, you don't write like that. You write in the third person such that it seems like it goes like it was observed in the study or the study showed an amount of five mils of the reagent was added, was used. Questionnaires were used to interview participants. So this shows that indeed you are not subjective, you are protected in the results in case they are not. Uh, it's not you personally that is responsible because it's the study that you are doing. You are you, you are putting the study forward that after carefully analyzing your data or after as you are going about doing these things, this is what you are bringing forward to the fore such that the reviewers or the the reader needs to appreciate that this work is objective. It doesn't, it has no influence of whether you did this or you you, you are the one that is that, that that was that measured five grams or measured uh, two mils of, of a particular reagent. It's not presented as that. It's supposed to be converted such that you are presenting it or reporting it in the third person. And that is quite an important uh, aspect of, of, of your write-up. Um, it is important that you remain or maintain formality. It is formal. When you are having these, um, when you are writing, you must have an awareness of your audience. Who are, who are the people that are going to be reading this material? So it's important that you have you are aware of this fact. When you publish your work, even it will remain for the long haul. It will be on the internet. It will be wherever. It will archive it. Even you yourself will archive it for a long, long time. So even when you, um, it, it should be able to reach audiences um, at various levels. Hence, it's important that you write it as formal as possible. You need to be aware you must not use um, colloquial language in academic writing. That means essentially you do not use the, the way the English that we use when we are on social media. WhatsApp and Facebook, the, we know the language or the way of writing and expressing ideas. The, 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 the spellings and the grammar is sometimes off. It's not really acceptable writing in, uh, in academic writing. You use written English as opposed to spoken English. That means you write written English means you use the words cannot, did not, is not. It's different for when you're speaking. When you're speaking, you just simply say can't or can't. Some people say that. Didn't it's not or isn't. Those are formal ways of writing. You do not use uh, regional dialect or expressions. So when you do that, when you use the regional dialects, some people are not from your locality. So it's, diff it's hard for them to follow when you are, when you, when, when you are, when you are dealing with, um, 
uh, when, when you're dealing with certain matters. I, don't, I, I can't even think of a situation, even in, in, in disciplines that are in social uh, sciences, unless, of course, you'd be able to express or to explain these expressions after collecting data. I'm trying to really think hard of a situation when you are collecting data and reports that you are getting uh, in a particular language. Probably you might have to ex explain that to your readers. If not, um, you, you, your, your supervisors will probably be there to, to guide. You use acronyms correctly. You use South Africa instead of, or if you're going to use SA, you first have to write it in full. I think that is uh, something that uh, you might know already. If you're writing things like UN, we all know what UN means. But then you have to write it in full in the initial uh, part. Sometimes it, it might be necessary to even include a, an abbreviation list or a list of abbreviations at the start or append it at the end. Use the, your use of language. In UNISA, or rather at UNISA, we prefer you to use um, most um, scholars even or, or most uh, of our, um, our supervisors at UNISA I probably use the UK language. That's also how I was trained that you use the UK language uh, in expressing or writing your, your uh, writing your material with words like behavior, fiber, center, color, it's different when you're writing it in the US language, it will not have the I and the U when you're especially I'm looking at the word behavior. It, it's just behavior with at the end, it's OR. At the end of fiber, it's ER. At the end of center, it's ER. So that is an American way of writing. So um, it's important that you adopt uh, the right way of uh, which is the UK English that is acceptable in writing academically, um, especially for our thesis, for the purposes of our thesis and uh, 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 is it research, yes. Now, the use of the dictionary in MS Word, you can use that one. However, you need to be able to read the statement. Sometimes that if you do a lot of work on Word, you write a lot of statement, a lot of material in Word. Sometimes it doesn't highlight your mistakes, so you should be able to read back and check and verify if grammatically you are correct or the spelling is correct. Because sometimes it's, 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 these are things that never get to be picked up. Again, you need to be concise. Try as much as possible to express, uh, explain, or, or stress on what you mean. You avoid redundancy and peddling. Um, you avoid repeating the same terms uh, in one sentence. So you have to make sure that these are some of the things you have to be aware of in your writing. So I put a little bit more on that. You avoid words like actually, really, uh, excellent, marvelous. You see, so in, in scientific writing, we use, we, we try to avoid, we use these words, the words like uh, significant or so significantly different. We don't necessarily say uh, very much different. The treatments are, the, the treatment is very different or it's an ex excellent, um, especially when you are comparing two, two or more things. We do not say all, all these words like actually or really, um, Marvelous, uh, marvelous. What we try to do is you maintain objectivity, just stress or just say that there were differences or there were significant differences, especially when you are going to be using statistical tools or procedures to measure the significant those uh, level of significance. You avoid using uh, a numeric or percentage when it's when starting a sentence. Uh, essentially, this means that when you're going to start a sentence in a particular paragraph, you don't start the sentence with a number. You don't start the sentence with um, a percentage, even you rather put the, the continue. 
you don't put a number at the beginning of the sentence. Numbers let another on another point, numbers that are less than 10 must be written in words. So if you're going to use 10 animals, for instance, for your 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 experiment, you can use the word 10. That write it in, you can you can write the number 10. But if you're going to use eight or four or six animals per per replicate, I don't know. That is when you, you expect, we must be mindful that you don't start with the number in that sentence that is one. Two, when you are writing it in in that within the particular sentence, the number that you are writing, which is less than 10, what we are illustrating is that it should be um, it, it should be in, in in words. There's an exception there that when you are writing, you, you should use unit. Uh, the exception is when you are using or when you're having units like five grams, uh, three percent, you can have numbers or numeric numeric there. But then when there are no units, in some instances where there are no units, you can have, or it's, it's preferred that you write it in words and you leave it at. Tables and figures, just a little bit about tables and figures. When you are writing tables and figures, note the caption. For tables, it is usually at the top. Excuse me. For, for caption, it's, it's usually at the top. Is this table here, it's called table four. Table four has means, SE, plus or minus SE, effects of um, standard, I mean, effects of different inclusion levels of Moringa, Oliveira, whole seed meal on internal and external air, characteristic, air quality attributes. So we have the air quality attributes going down here, and then the Moringa inclusion levels, of seed meal inclusion levels, you have a control one, uh, three, five, and then we have the p values there. So, this is basically another way of presenting tables. You must understand that when you are writing your tables, there are, there are no vertical lines, that is one, and two, the horizontal lines are just at the top and at the bottom. So, if you don't necessarily need to have horizontal lines going across in every line that you have there, or rather after every after every line. It's important that you present it like this so that the reader again benefits from the work. It's published. I mean, most published material goes with uh, with the standard. It's not a standard that is that I'm prescribing, but then. You'll find it when you're going to publish some articles or some some journals will indicate to you that you should adhere to these rules, otherwise it won't be published. In fact, even in some at institutional levels, this uh, this is the standard that we do not have horizontal lines. There are so many going down, especially after, after within the attributes and the vertical lines are not there. So the tables are presented like that. And there it is. So with respect to figures, sometimes these horizontal lines as well, just as well removed. So I picked this up from another publication. Um, unfortunately, I didn't, I, I don't have the citations here with me. But then again, you see that the caption is at the bottom for this one. So for figures, the captions are written at the bottom, whilst the the captions for the tables are at the top. This is meant to essentially facilitate the work for 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 the readers. You, you need to be consistent in presenting tables and figures. The style, the font size, and color. If you adopt a, 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 a system like this of writing one table, this means that all your tables need to look, uh, will look, um, will have a template such as this one, where you do not change the font a lot. You don't have to be changing the font. You find that in this is not that this is table four. When you look at table five, you shouldn't find something, a presentation that is different 
from what we have here, or rather that is different from the template of this table. Same with this one. You, you look at this uh, figure, other figures, this is figure 1.7. Figures 1.1 uh, 1 .1 up to 1.6, I would assume that they all have this sort of templates. They all look like this. They have these colors, if ever we're going to use two or more colors, they have similar colors. You don't have different uh, colors coming up with the different graphs that you're going to have in your in your write up. So you make sure that you have you maintain consistency in that style, in the font and also the color. I know I'm repeating a lot of things here, but then it's basically meant to emphasize um, the point that um, so that you can try to understand. Says yeah, do not be influenced by other publication styles of presentation of presenting graphs and tables. So whatever you're presenting, you have to ensure that you stick to your style. As you do more read up, as you do uh, other readings, you find that style. You find that um, authors use different styles or uh, have different ways of presenting uh, particular results. So. This is to ensure that you remain consistent. You just take the information that you need from the, uh, whatever information that you need that is being portrayed by the tables or the graphs, then you utilize that and cite it accordingly. However, you, it's important that you're not influenced to adopt that style and then you want to write it. You have to ensure that what you are write is consistent. Then there's a point that academic writing needs to be balanced. What you are writing needs to be balanced. Citing sources demonstrates uh, it's, it's a demonstration of knowledge or it demonstrates knowledge. Sorry about that. It's a, when you are citing different sources, it shows the reader that you have read other material. You consider other or rather other, other authors views other authors' perspectives to balance or to avoid biasness. Include examples of ideas that disagree with you in your write-up, as well as the ones that do not, or that are aligned with you. So you make sure that you include the various, just, this is just like when you are arguing with someone, whilst you are acknowledging some of the points that they bring forward, but you endorse yours, you make your submissions alive and true to the to the effect or to the point that you are making. Similarly, when you are writing, you acknowledge the perspectives or the views of other writers or other authors, but then you must stress yours and find ones that are aligning with your with your point of view. And that basically helps the viewer, helps the reader understand the material that you are writing. It shows that it's balanced. Popular research authorities must be used and cited accordingly in the respective fields of study. Know who the, the, the popular or the common authors are in your discipline. In physics, there are authors there. There are people there that are scholars that we know of. If you're in genetics, there's one there that shows Gregor Mendel one called Gregor Mendel that, that, that that's in genetics. So I'm using that as an example that you need to cite uh, scholars that are of great repute, that are common, that are popular. If you are in music, there's another fellow there. If you are in, um, in if you are in theology, you probably know who that is, Mother Teresa, uh, our, our Nelson Mandela, and even uh, Martin Luther King. So these are some of the scholars, or not even scholars, these are some of the people that we, we know often and we often quote. When we quote them, people know exactly who that who came up with that statement or who came up with that information such that we can use it to, to support our, our writing and then our readers get to benefit more and appreciate the material that we are presenting. 
you present views from different authors logically. Essentially, that means you compare the author, the views, you evaluate it, you integrate it nicely or accordingly in your write-up. You don't just uh, find, you determine relevance, you determine if it's important. You, uh, earlier on, we mentioned that you critically evaluate the literature that you get before you just put it in your, your write-up. You observe consistency in the style of writing. Again, this point comes up. It's, it's easy to lose yourself when you're writing and you get um, you, you get you get misled or you get drifted by the points that other authors are bringing across. So it's important that you maintain objectivity or you maintain the same uh, style of writing. When you are reading a lot of material, you will tend to find that there are there are different styles of people uh, people use when they are writing their um, materials, academic materials, just as well. For references, you use reliable references. You go to journals, books, uh, conference proceedings. All these are found on Google Scholar, Scorpus, Science Direct, Web of Science, PubMed. So these are some of the platforms where you can find journals, books, and conference proceedings. These um, are material that are of, of, better, uh, of great repute. We use them mostly because they are peer reviewed. That is a key thing in our our, our, our write up, especially in, in basically in, in all the fields academically. We have to know that whatever you cite, whoever you cite has to be people that have been peer reviewed. Avoid predatory journals. Predatory journals uh, are those journals that are found to be or that are, that are deemed to, to 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 prey on authors really because when you are publishing and doing your research work you want it to be out as quick as possible so there are those journals that tend to come up they they, they just a, they might be a starter up they must be a start they might be a starter up company wherein they just uh, they they start they get people to, 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 to affiliate with them or to publish their articles whilst they don't meet uh, certain standards that are of, but of good repute. So they are deemed uh, predatory in that regard because they, they don't have, um, they, they don't have a good or uh, a good standards in terms of peer reviewing such that they are relegated and put in that class of predatory journal or predatory publishers. So a list of uh, a list of, uh, of reliable sources or a list of journals that you can use are available at the library. There's public there's a there's a link there you can follow so which um, will take you to the site that has a list of journals that you can use for for your sources. I, I well I use that I use this that link so that you can be able to to follow that one. There's another point that the research that I mean the, the citations or that you are going to use they must be less than five years. This is a standard or this is a, a, a something that we use quite recent uh, quite a lot in, in academics. Whatever you cite needs to be less than five years old, unless, of course, it is something that is um, that is foundational. It's something that is critical to your study. So you see, then you might realize that you are dealing with um, you, you are dealing with a subject that 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 is not uh, reviewed or that is not um, studied quite a lot. But then if you are in the sciences, you might want to make sure that whatever it is that you are writing about, uh, or rather what is it what is that you are reading and citing, it's recent articles. This, the word recent means less than five years old. When you are doing your research, when you are doing your MSc or PhD, you start by doing your proposals. That's when you do a lot of uh, reading. So you find that 
when we are starting, when just when we are enrolling, you, you enroll, you'll be enrolled, um, you'll be enrolled in the first year. Some people take four years to finish. Some people take five. Some people take, I don't know, longer than that. But then whenever time you finish, the material that you have, that you have cited and when you are sending this material to, when you're sending your, 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 your write-up to, to, your, to be reviewed, the, the, the reviewers might find that all your, your citations, all your, your references that you used, probably are old, are older than five years, and then the report will come that you need to update your sources. So it's important that you be aware of the point that you use relevant or not just relevant, you use recent literature. You keep all your sources safe or upload them in a folder uh, or in a flash drive, I don't know, but make sure that uh, you keep all your sources that you are citing in a safe place. There are tools, there are uh, tools that are available for that. Um, uh, what's we call the reference managers that we use. So you need to, if you really need those to use those, you can contact the library. Again, on references, citations, citation of references in the text should be as follows. You, some people use authors, or author, and then publication, sorry for that spelling mistake, publications, publication year in parentheses. The example I have is of Sapir and Dudley 2012. They said, or if I may read it, Sapir and Dudley 2012 indicated that hummingbirds can fly backwards. Hmm. Hummingbirds can fly backwards, that's the statement uh, said by or that was found by those two authors. Another way of presenting this information is to have the authors and the year uh, and the year in parentheses. The example would go as follows: Hummingbirds can fly backwards, and then in brackets you say Sapir Dudley, Sapir and Dudley, um, 2012. So these I'm just using this way these two in order to show you that you can. Do your citations in in really a different way. It's up and it's up to it's all up to the the writer which way you use or which way you choose to do. So when you are writing like that, like in the last point where you say where we said hummingbirds can fly backwards uh, by quote or in, in parentheses say Sapir and Dudley 2012. Note the usage of the ampersand in the example above. So the exam in the example, there's this ampersand that I used today. I didn't write the word and that I did deliberately. Whilst in the first example, if you can follow with the pointer there, there's the word and. So different journals, the point I want to illustrate is that different journals use different uh, approaches. They can say when you are citing your references, you can use the word and in, in, in full like this, or you can even use the Emerson sign to say the word and. So this is entirely dependent on the publisher or the, publish, uh, the publication uh, journal. Note that also the period, that is the full stop at the end, it comes at the end, after the authors in the second example, the, the, the period is here. Whilst in some instances you say et al, when there are many authors, when there are many authors, they use the word et al, and then the, the period comes before it, the, with the, along with the word et al. Unfortunately, I, did, I, don't have, I didn't have an example for that one, but then what I wanted to just highlight is that the period or that full stop comes after the, parent, the, the parenthesis day. You avoid using the same reference or source multiple times. Try to avoid that in your sentence or statements or in your paragraphs. Limit the number of so the, the, the number of times you use um, you use your reference. What you can do is we can basically find other sources that say that maybe say the same uh, statements or same that illustrate that same point.
sources and referencing continues there. Uh, to summarize other authors' work, shorten the ver uh, sh present a shortened version in your own words and not verbatim. So this illustrates that whatever you are citing, whatever material you want to cite, you are getting from a reference. You write it in your own words, and then of course you invite the, the, the authors or the people that said that. You identify the relevant points. This is supposedly when you are having a, a, a paragraph, you should be able to summarize the relevant points then you write, you present those points and cite the reference. Ensure that you include citations in the text and also in the reference section. So this is possible. It's something that happens when we are uh, writing the final report or the final thesis or dissertation. Some some reviewers would actually check for this. If uh, some people even get irritated that you didn't. Um, include your, 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 the people that you cited in the text, they are not included in the reference section. So make sure that everyone, every person or every, all the authors that you cite, they are there as well, or as well in the reference section or in the bibliography. That's what I mean by reference section. To minimize plagiarism, uh, also you need to minimize plagiarism. Visualize. Present views of authors. I think we've mentioned the statement before. We present views of from different authors. Logically, we've mentioned this before. But move on to the next slide. Um, when you're writing your conclusion, okay, not that this is a conclusion. When you're writing the conclusions, your conclusion must comprise of the main points of your findings, presumably. You highlight the key results or outputs from the research. Again, in your own words, you do not have a, uh, you don't have to cite people in your, in your conclusion. Um, recommendations or you re make recommendations in the conclusion sections if that is, if it's appropriate or if you do have recommendations. You use, um, use the present tense. And also there's a point that no new information comes up in the conclusion. That would really be uh, something else. So when you're writing a conclusion, make sure that everything, or rather, before you submit or before you even write the conclusion, all the new material, all the, 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 the points that you need to cover in your write-up are there. They do not just show up at the end and don't surprise the, the, the reader at the end about the information, about, about new information that you might have thought of or might have been, uh, uh, that might have been brought to your awareness at that stage. What you can do is you have to put that information where it's relevant in the, either in the discussion section or results or wherever it might be relevant. Then you can talk about it in the, in the conclusion. Again, for bibliographies or references, this one is basically a list of all the citations that you used in your write-up. You must have this, uh, this list of uh, references. It indicates, uh, it's an indication of the literature that you used or that you reviewed as, um, as a scholar yourself. It's important that you go through this one or rather you, you have this attached or, in, or included in your in your submission if you are writing for the cases of submissions. The reference styles are determined by the disciplines or journal or publisher if ever it, if there is a publisher that you are going to be using or they are determined by the institution. There's a style that is acceptable by, by, and this differs with the colleges as well that we have at UNISA. It, I can't recommend a standard, but then you can use um, the reference manager. The reference manager will be able to to, to populate the reference, all the, the the citations that you used, 
and then they make a list for you and make a nice long bibliography if you used uh, a lot of uh, citations. Otherwise, you can even write them up yourself, prepare them properly according to the, the style that is preferred by the university. Having said that, um, um, I think I have covered basically what I wanted to say. Um, I would like to just leave you with this slide where we talked about skills and attributes of academic writing. So this to me, it summarizes everything that we have been talking about this past, uh, what is this? Almost one and a half hours, I don't know, one, over an hour. We are talking about skills and attributes of academic writing. These are the skills that one needs to possess. So having said that, ladies and gentlemen, I, I will pause there and attend to the questions that, are, that are, arise. Thank you.